Welcome back to God Loves Kids TV. We hope you're enjoying Pastor Phil's ongoing series, A Perfect Father. Today, Pastor Phil's challenge to you. We hope you're prepared for a great lesson. Sit back, relax, and here's Pastor Phil. The last time we were together, we looked at the ABCs of faith. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful way to, to understand faith, understand real faith, not you know, a Cadillac on your refrigerator I'm believing for. In fact, I challenge people all the time. Every Christian needs to have a child on their refrigerator, that they're believing for the provision for that child, the salvation of that child. It's one, one of the reasons child sponsorship is such an effective form of missions. We see it change lives, consistently change lives in a radical way. <clears throat> and we're exploring the idea of how the blessing lays the foundation for discipleship. But you can't disciple without faith. You have to have this action based upon a belief sustained by confidence that what God has said is true, operational in your life. You can't, you can't disciple someone into the kingdom of God without faith. You, you have, it's impossible to please God without faith. You know, it's not your works that get you there. It's your faith that gets you there. Now, faith requires an action, but it's not the action that gains God's approval. It is the action based on God's word, sustained by confidence in his reality, that gains approval. Do you see the difference? It's not just you acting. And see what happens is, when you act, when Peter stepped out of the boat, that first step was his own kinetic energy. He decided in obedience to turn the direction of the caller. That's what obedience is. I hear the voice of the caller, I turn his direction. He decided in his heart that when Jesus said come, he would come. And he took that first step out of the boat. Everything after that was because of empowerment. Waters don't solidify in the natural. You know, you move forward in life because, yes, I take the first step as an action of obedience. But then God's empowerment, you, you step off into the river flow of the anointing. And the anointing is not something that just your pastor experiences on Sunday morning. When you act in obedience to God's word and you're acting in faith, you have peace, then you step into that anointing river that drives you pushes you. It's a, it's a force that continues to be operational in your life. And you go further than you could ever go on your own. And you do things you could never do in your own strength. And in fact, when people say that they're called of God to do something, the next thing I expect them to say is, but I don't feel capable of doing it. In fact, if you don't say that to me, I'd start to question the calling. Because God never calls anybody to do anything they're capable of doing in their own strength. Let me say that again. God never calls anyone to do anything that they're capable of doing in their own strength. He calls us to do what requires faith and requires anointing in order to accomplish. We have to be empowered to accomplish kingdom purposes in kingdom ways. It doesn't happen without that. And, and God is our perfect father. He's also the king of the kingdom. So your father is the king, which makes you a prince, makes you a royal priest. Your father is the king. He's a perfect father. And he's the ultimate priest. Okay. He is the object of the worship that we have. So it, it, it's very simple. I'm not teaching things that a lot of seasoned Christians don't hear on a regular basis. They just don't have it all put together in a package that allows them to communicate it. That's what this is all about. There are eight things in this process. First is the blessing. That's the first four things. The, the next four is the discipleship or discipline phase. Okay, so in order to be blessed, we have to know, we have to unconditionally accept, we have to unconditionally love, and we have our needs met according to his riches and glory. So we're going to meet someone else's needs if we're going to bless them. For you to be blessed, you have to be known by God. You have to be unconditionally accepted by God, unconditionally loved. First stage of love in God's love pantheon 
is unconditional love. It is not the ending place, it's the beginning. Okay? It's not the omega, it's the alpha when it comes to love from God. God's love is deeper and broader than you could ever imagine. In fact, it's often understood or said that until you preach grace to the point that someone thinks you're abusing it, you haven't preached it correctly. Right? Until you are criticized for preaching grace and taking it too far, you haven't taken it far enough. That's why, you know, again, it doesn't concern me to receive criticism and I won't debate people theologically. I don't debate. If you have an honest question and want an honest answer, I'm willing to give that. But if you want to debate something, take your troll on down the road, okay? Because you don't know me, you don't accept me, you don't love me, and you haven't worked to meet my needs, so you have no role in correcting me at all. None whatsoever. I do not receive correction from people I'm not in relationship with, ever. And nor should you. You shouldn't allow someone to stop you in a parking lot of a church you just visited and say, brother, I love you, but, and give you some prophetic word. It, it, that was a sport in my Bible college, is correcting one another. I mean, people ran around acting like they were had this prophetic anointing and, you know, they could barely get up and, and pay their own bills in the morning uh, or pay their way through school. Uh, and there's no criticism there, but... You know, some of them didn't even know how to brush their teeth, and yet they'd walk up to me and say, Brother, I love you, but, and try to correct me. Um, and I'd been in ministry for a couple years before I went to Bible college. Uh, I knew a couple of things. I'd grown up in it. And so I wasn't there uh, at the same level that they were at. And yet they felt free to correct me. And, and if you know me, if you're in relationship with me, and I recognize that, I will sit and accept correction. I will sit and accept a voice in my life. But if you don't know me, don't even try. It's not worth it. I'm just going to delete it. I'm not even going to read it. Randy back here is running the camera. He's going to delete it before I ever see it. Okay? We're not. It. We're going to block you on Facebook. It's not going to be worth your time or energy to try to correct us because this is a life message for me. God started revealing it to me at 14 and has continued to reveal it to me and has given me a way to teach it so that you might teach others. If you love it, if you accept it, if you're pleased by it, if it creates questions in your life, you want those questions answered, I'm happy that we're here for you. But if you want, all you want to do is criticize and correct, you're at the wrong place. Okay? So let, again, I say that as a foundation. So when we look at this whole idea, of active faith. Why do we have this action of faith? Well, fundamentally, to start with, we have this action of faith because we are to pass our faith. We are to be uh, uh, representatives of faith to others. You know, well, our first and foremost calling is to pass it to our children. You know, God is a generational God. He's seeking a godly seed. He's always sought a godly seed. The, the power of Christianity is in the multiplication of generations knowing him. Uh, and God is into that. God is into math. I like to say God's a good Jewish boy. And he likes multiplication better than addition. There's a power in being multiplied. Okay? And so, so God's a generational God. So when we see this act of faith, we want people to know that, they are, that they're loved, that they can trust God, that they can be of service to God, that they can live their lives in a way that blesses future generations, not just now, that their lives can have a meaning and a purpose. And we want to bring discipleship to people. That's the ultimate goal, to bring discipleship. But I'm not qualified to disciple anyone that I don't bless. So I've got to know them, unconditionally accept them, which is different than unconditional approval, unconditionally love them, and work toward meeting some of their needs, then I'm qualified, after I've thoroughly blessed that person, it may take six months or a year to thoroughly bless them, then I'm qualified to start discipleship where I'm teaching or training, dealing with the will, teaching, dealing with the mind, correcting, dealing with negative behavior and bringing them back to the center, and reward. 
showing them how they can activate God's rewards in their life. I'm not called to reward everybody for doing something right, but I'm, I'm called to show them that if you're obedient, obedience done in faith releases reward. And that's what I'm called to do. And so when we look at the close of the Old Testament, we see a scripture in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Yes, there is something in Malachi besides chapter 2. I know some of your Bibles just fall open automatically to chapter 2, and you're looking for everything to be running over, shaken together, and, uh, and poured out. And that's all the scripture you know in Malachi, because that's the only one your pastor quotes to you out of Malachi, is Malachi chapter 2. But there is Malachi chapter 3, and there is Malachi chapter 4, and there's some wonderful stuff in this prophetic book. And, and God is showing through Malachi at the end of the Old Testament what he's about to do. And he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts, turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So God is saying that we need to have our hearts turned and have a passion to, to set the stage for our children's hearts to turn toward us. Whether they're spiritual children or physical children in the natural, we are, we are in the heart-turning business. And the way you turn hearts is to bless them. It's very simple. You have four things you need to do to bless someone. Now, I, I'm going to break all those things down and help show you some of the elements and some of the ways of doing those, but you get it. There's four things in the blessing. And that blessing is very unique because it has the power to eliminate negative behavior. 80% of all negative behavior in human beings comes from a lack of blessing, as far as I'm concerned. People do not feel fundamentally blessed in their life. They don't feel like they matter. They don't feel like they're known. They feel like they were an accident or a mistake. They feel like they're one in a billion or one in seven billion. They're lost in the universe. They're alone. They have loneliness permeating every cell of their being. They're adrift in an ocean of darkness, and they just don't have that sense of being important, being God-ordained, being God-created. You know, they don't know who they are. There's a true crisis in identity in our country today. People don't even know which bathroom to go to. It's a crisis of identity. And how do we know who we are? Because we're known by God and he's told us who we are. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. My presence surrounds you as the hills surround Jerusalem. I am something that was ordained of God from the, the point before creation, before love. Boom! In the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. He knew you before that. He knew you'd be here in 2018. He knew you'd be sitting listening to me. This is our ordained time and place to be together. And whether you're Randy sitting in the studio right now, hearing my voice, or you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook or wherever else you're seeing this, this is our ordained time and place to be together. And this word is for you. God ordained this word for you. And I'm, I'm challenging you. Go back. View all these videos. Let me also challenge you with this. We're to turn the hearts, our hearts toward our children, to our hearts toward others that God has placed us in community with. We're to turn our hearts toward our neighbors. And we're to reach out to the othermost parts of the earth. We're to have a heart of compassion that reaches out. But, but when you understand that, and you see that, hey, I'm important to this role in the kingdom. God's not trying to use me. I play a function in the role. And yes, I am a part of the big picture, but I am a part that's recognized by God as being important, no matter where I'm at. You may not ever have a big TV ministry <clears throat> like this one. All 50 people are watching this video right now. Um, it's going to grow, I know, but, but you know, we're not on, on international television. I'm not trying to do that. 
you know, I, I don't ride around in a limo every day. I put my pants on the same way you do. I, I had to work in the yard the other day. I planted 300 flower bulbs in my front yard. Almost killed myself uh, doing it. Planted a tomato plant. I, other than being here and traveling around the world, I try to live a very real life, very connected life to the people around me. I try to have re real relationships with people. I try to be transparent with people around me. I'm trying to be transparent with you as we take this journey together. But the, the idea is that God ended the Old Testament with this important event. He could have said anything at the end. But he said, look, I've got to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers in a supernatural way. And then he begins the New Testament in Luke chapter 1, verse 17 with, and I will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Notice something. The hearts of the fathers to their children and, see he's using this whole thing as a picture of our life before him, the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, meaning you're supposed to be discipled, and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. What prepares a people for the Lord? They have their hearts turned toward their earthly fathers and their spiritual fathers. And their spiritual fathers have a deeper concern for their spiritual children than what those children are going to do for them. My concern goes much further than what you put in the offering, what you send on PayPal to God loves kids. It has to, or this breaks down. My concern is not primarily gathering a bunch of people so that they can give in the offering. And no good pastor functions that way. He has a heart for his people. I say every pastor should smell like sheep. You can't be a shepherd and, and not touch the sheep. You, you have to be in contact with them in some way or another. You have to sleep in the sheep gate to make sure that, that it's protected. You have to be close. You don't get to be removed and be a pastor. I, I, I may be giving you pastoral ministry right now in a way, but I'm not your pastor. Why, I can't touch you. I can't touch you. So I'm, a, I'm gonna give you what God's put in my heart, but you need a local pastor to be in a relationship with. You need someone who protects your sheep gate, who smells like you because they've been in contact with you. So anyhow, the, the New Testament opens up with John the Baptist coming in the spirit of Elijah. To do what? Just to eat locusts and to wear camel hair? You know, I mean, this guy was far out. I mean, he was a rock star, if you will. He lived the rock star lifestyle, except for he lived it in a monkish way. You know, he had funky clothes. He had funky hair. He ate a funky diet. And, uh, and he was out there proclaiming something to the people. What was he proclaiming? He was not pro proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He wasn't demanding change of the people based on their negative behavior. He was there under the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of the leaders toward the, the people and the hearts of the people toward the leaders and thereby, listen to this, thereby the disobedient, those people who are acting wrong, are changed so that they respond to the wisdom of the righteous. How does that happen? How do disobedient experience a change in their life so then they, ex they respond to the wisdom of the righteous? That's what we want to have happen in our children's lives. They're going their own direction. They're going their own way. They're, they're try, but we want to hot them. We want to, to train them up in the way they should go. So we're giving them wisdom. We want them to respond to that wisdom. The first step in getting someone to respond to the wisdom that God has given you is to bless them. You know them. You unconditionally accept them. You unconditionally love them. You meet their needs. Okay? And that means your heart is turned toward them. You can't bless someone that you haven't given your heart to. 
and your heart is turned toward them and their hearts turn toward you and it starts this this parent child relationship and that's exactly take it back that's exactly what goes on spiritually now as i close out today i want to challenge you with this one of the great ways of understanding the bible i want you to stop reading the whole bible for a while okay i want you to just just set everything else aside and I want you to, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to read the book of Galatians every day for 30 days. It's only six chapters long. You can do this. You can listen to it in your car. You can, you can experience it in any way you want. You can watch it on video, listen to it in your car. You can read it. But experience the book of Galatians without commentary. Without my commentary, without anybody's commentary. I don't want you to research the book of Galatians. I just want you to read it every day for 30 days. And then I want you to do a systematic reading of the book of Mark. And when you're finished with the book of Mark, I want you to read the book of Galatians. And when you're finished with the book of Galatians, I want you to read the book of Mark. I want you to do that for a year. You do that for a year. And then you sit in your local congregation and you think to yourself two things when someone's preaching to you. Or when you're watching Christian TV, this is a great one for Christian TV. Would a perfect father treat his children that way? That's your first glasses to see any teaching through. Would a perfect father treat his children that way? Secondly, second pair of glasses we want to put on, does it line up with Paul's manifesto of faith, which is the book of Galatians? He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament under the direction and the anointing and the calling of God to do so. I think he knows what he's talking about. And Galatians is the most concise presentation of the gospel functionally. Okay? Mark is the gospel. Galatians is the so what? Here's how you do it every day. Okay? So you got Mark that presents to you the gospel. You've got Galatians that shows you how to live it out. And you, you use those two things. Mark, Galatians, and what a perfect father Treat his children that way, and you're going to be able to delineate when someone's teaching you the meat of the Word of God from the bones of humanity. Every fish comes with meat and bones, and you need to be able to decipher the difference between the meat and the bones for yourself. We hope you enjoyed Part 7 in this ongoing series, A Perfect Father. Pastor Phil's Challenge God Loves Kids is an international ministry dedicated to helping the neediest children in the world find hope for a new beginning and a better story. If you enjoyed this video, please leave us a comment down below. We'd love to hear from you. If you were touched by this ministry today and would like to stand with us in our ongoing mission, please visit the links below. You can also help our ministry by liking this video and subscribing to our YouTube page, GLKTV. Tune in anytime to find out the latest comings and goings from God Loves Kids. Thank you for your time today, and we hope to see you next time. Until then, this is Randy Capes with God Loves Kids reminding you to love everyone you can. Amen.